Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager here. And I don't often say this, but I have one of the greatest living thinkers on the line. His name is George Gilder. I have read him since I was in college. I have interviewed him on most of his books. And he has done three courses for Prager University. And he is, this is my highest accolade, aside from a very good man, which is the highest. He is an original thinker. That's very rare. George Gilder, I hope I didn't embarrass you. Well, thank you, Dennis. It's always thrilling to be on your program. And I return all the accolades in your direction. Well, (laughs) it's very sweet. That's just an ode to your kindness. He has a new book out. It's called Life After Google. The fall, the fall of big data and the rise of the blockchain economy. He has been very good in his predictions, folks. So I take this stuff seriously, but I will admit it's a little hard to imagine right now life after Google, George. They are pretty powerful. Just as IBM was the dominant force in the world economy 25 years ago, regarded to be an appropriate target for government antitrust and government harassment, Google has reached a similar pinnacle just before it begins to decline. Right. And why? Well, there were, there were of course, rivals to IBM that simply superseded it. What, what will cause Google to fall? They have, they have a philosophy that is false, a system of the world which will fail. Uh, they, rather than trying to enhance, provide tools to enhance human productivity, they think they're providing artificial intelligence and machine learning to usurp human minds and transcend human minds in a singularity of and uh, this is a new form of Marxism, in my view. Just as Marx imagined that the great industrial breakthroughs of the 19th century were the final accomplishment of human industry, and that the future would consist in programs for redistributing existing wealth, so the Google people imagine that their current technologies, their uh, machine learning, their artificial intelligence, their super artificial intelligence, their Google minds, their robots, obsolete human beings, and uh, that somehow their computers can be minds. And it's an utterly delusional idea, and it's implemented by a business strategy that will fail. Right, but the reason we think of Google today is not because of its commitment to artificial intelligence, but because 90% of all searches on Earth are done through Google. Yep, yep, Google. However, 52% of all searches that are seeking to actually purchase a good or service are now done through Amazon. Amazon is usurping Google in commercial search and... uh, Google's advertising strategy, which is a complete non-starter on the portable telecomputers, our smartphones, which uh, are the chief vehicle now, are, are uh, just congest the machines and uh, are increasingly subjected to ad blockers, and and uh, they're on the way down. All right, so give us a picture in your, uh, even if it's from your imagination, of what could supersede Google. What can supersede Google is what I call the cryptocosm, the uh, new economy that's emerging from blockchains and other cryptographic innovations that create a new architecture for the internet and replace the top down. Uh, insecure, porous, uh, manipulated uh, architecture of Google with uh, an architecture that's bottom-up 
and based on the securely maintained identities and privacy and content of the users. Well, let's put it as simply as I can at any rate. If I, if I want to Google what books did George Gilder write, so actually that's funny that I'm asking that because I've just answered the question with your previous comment. The truth is I would go to Amazon to find out what you wrote. You probably would, wouldn't you? Yes, I would, in fact. In fact, that's probably the answer that would come up in any event. George Gilder at Amazon. All right, so let's do a different one. Who fought the 30 years war? So where would you go today to find out the answer to that? I certainly would go to Google. And I'm not disparaging Google's magnificent accomplishment in creating a 43 um, megahertz search engine. Uh, uh, millions of searches a minute. It's, it's an awesome accomplishment. Uh, but it's, it's now uh, been accomplished. And it's accompanied not by a big flow of income from the service that they're providing, but rather by collecting data from its customers and agglomerating it in big data and uh, selling the big data to advertisers. And that kludge, that uh, uh, roundabout way of collecting money is going to be of declining effectiveness in coming years. And Google knows it. Google is trying to switch from search, where they send you to some other web page, to solutions. So Google will have all the answers. Uh, but, uh, and, but that transition will be awkward, and they have many, uh, many rivals in supplying it. And particularly in the face of the change in the balance of power on the Internet, that will be accomplished by the blockchain revolution. Okay, you'll have to explain that. Let me just remind everybody, I'm speaking with George Gilder, whose books have had a deep impact on my life. In fact, on my 10 that most influenced me, George Gilder's book originally titled Sexual Suicide, I think. What was it What was it when you republished Sexual Suicide? Men and, men and Marriage is still yeah. in print, and it's... It still says everything that Jordan Peterson says more eloquently, perhaps. No, I'm not knocking Jordan. Uh, no, no, I, I'm a big fan of both of yours, uh, but there not, nothing competes with what you wrote there. It was it was life changing for me uh, to read those two books about men, about sexuality, about men and women. So anyway, it's up there at, uh, on my list of, of of the ten books. George Not Gilder's America. latest book is Life After Google. All right, so now explain uh, to uh, those of us who don't know, I am one of them, what is blockchain? Um, blockchain is a distributed way of uh, collecting and validating information. You know, what Google does is uh, create, provide security by uh, concentrating all the information in a big data center somewhere and uh, controlling it and defending it with firewalls and encryption and intrusion detection systems and, and other uh, defense and SWAT teams of anti-hackers. Uh, but uh, they're discovering that centralization is not safe. All the, the uh, Internet is hopelessly insecure. And in an Internet, insecure Internet, all the money and power gets sucked up to the top. That architecture is being countered by a blockchain or a block stack where uh, individuals keep their own personal data and uh, uh, transactions and collections of uh, secure facts and truths and data are incorporate or distributed across all the nodes in the network through a ingenious mathematical process called hashing. So they're all connected together and time stamped and can't be changed unless you capture half the computers on the network 
and and uh, which is virtually impossible to do. All right. I'm speaking with and to George Gilder, Life After Google, 18 Prager 776. The book, of course, is up at DennisPrager.com. The Dennis Prager Show, live from the Relief Factor Pain Free Studio. George Gilder, uh, you write about many things, including in your latest book. The book is up at DennisPrager.com, folks, Life After Google. One more tech question, and then I want to ask you about the current political situation and colleges and much more. And that is, what? so you're not, you're not gung-ho on the future of Google. What, what's the story? I assume you have the same feelings towards Facebook and the like? Uh, yes. Facebook also tries to um, collect big data and transform it into advertising. And nobody wants to read advertising in their timeline. It's just a loser strategy to begin with. And by the way, no in one that, wants yes. to listen to an ad before their YouTube. That's right. So um, let me ask you, that is a very, very interesting point. Every single time a sound comes on, uh, one of these videos comes on that I didn't ask for when I go to a page at, at some website, I immediately put on the mute button. I, I can't believe that I am alone in doing that. Why do they, why do they think it's so profitable? Because they think they can collect all the data in the world and create a machine mind that can anticipate all the desires of the customers and deliver advertising to them that they will right. want. Okay. And will I, create a vast new accumulation of wealth. Right. Or, right. I understand uh, that. All right. So I wasn't, I was not precise. Why do they think I, the consumer will watch that video? That's what I meant to ask. Uh, they, I don't think they do anymore. They, it's been this, you know, it's, it's shown that at least on, on smartphones, 0.003% of the ads are actually clicked through. In other words, it's, it's just a complete failure, this effort to insert ads in smartphones. And so this whole uh, teetering tower of technology is about to crash and give way to a new uh, economy based on the cryptographic advances that are already transforming uh, the global financial system as we speak. $17 billion has been raised on the Ethereum platform to in smart contracts that produce ICOs, initial coin offerings that have really replaced IPOs in the U.S. economy. Will all of this lead to more or less free speech on the internet? It'll I, more free speech. I, I I think this business of having the government regulate all these. Um, channels of is or is just uh, a non-starter. Having Zuckerberg have to decide just what to do about each issue as it emerges is quite absurd. Uh, defining whether news is fake or fact, and and I th I think that uh, the blockchain economy will allow the establishment of facts. It's an actually a better system, even than cash. A cash is anonymous, but cash doesn't allow you to document your transactions and behavior. So the government can make any charges against you, can manipulate the facts. Uh, a timestamp blockchain record of transactions and behavior and licenses and patents and and uh, 
your own truth is unimpeachable, and it gives the citizen a way to fight back against uh, government right. uh, charges. George, if right fa- if they're false. Right now, George, uh, about forty pre-university videos have been on the restricted list of uh, Google, uh, which owns YouTube. Under your prognosis, will that change? That will change. That uh, you'll be able to... uh, A new regime of micropayments will become possible. You'll be able to make very small charges that that suffice to halt spam, but... uh, which uh, are hassle-free and and allow an economy to emerge in which really valuable products like Prager University courses uh, can uh, prevail over all uh, the trash that is increasingly accumulating in the Internet um, site. Right. All right. Let's move on to some some other uh, issues in in current life, just to get your take on it. You uh, and I uh, are both uh, fans, uh, not fans, of what has happened to the universities. Why do so many businesses say you have to have a college degree in order to apply for a job when it's completely irrelevant and probably half the great people didn't even go to college? Well, this is my life after Google is full of critiques of the university system and alternatives to it. And uh, the the reason is because uh, all the anti-discrimination and affirmative action rulings have um, made employment uh, really illegal to discriminate among people on the basis of merit and accomplishment, you have to uh, use credentialism. And credentialism is the defense that universities use against the affirmative action bureaucracies that uh, try to break down um, their um, employment practices. All right. Final segment coming up. If you want to ask George Gilder anything on anything, 1-8-Prager-776-877-243. Triple seven six. His book, Life After Google, is up at DennisPrager.com. The Dennis Prager Show, live from the Relief Factor pain-free studio. Dennis Prager here, and I might... My guest is a George Gilder, esteemed thinker in my opinion, and I felt this way my whole life. His latest book is Life After Google. I just want you to know his prediction rate is a very, very high percentage, way higher than the uh, the guys who make the Hall of Fame even. The, he's batting like 900 uh, in, his, uh, in his predictions. I'm very curious. I've never talked to you about this. I don't know what your answer will be, so I'll I'll just venture a question. Since uh, since the day Donald Trump was elected, the country has experienced, in my opinion, but if you differ, please f- totally feel free to say so, a, a, a hysterical reaction after hysterical reaction. To the point where he is now routinely called a Nazi and a traitor. <laughs> All right, I guess that is the answer. So how do you view this unprecedented irrationality that is engulfing the elite? I think Trump is a business leader who has to be tested by his action. He's a man of action. And uh, they're obsessed with his words, uh, but they are actually uh, shocked by his actions, uh, moving the embassy to Jerusalem. Well, politicians have been promising that for decades. He did it. Uh, closed down the Paris climate change cult. 
Uh, that was uh, a lot of people have raised questions about this global climate fantasy, but uh, Trump just uh, really reversed our policy, made America um, open to industry again. Uh, he's, uh, his trade uh, policy, I don't agree with on the surface, but it attacks a major flaw in the, in the fabric of global capitalism, and that is uh, the foreign exchange market that are now 75 times bigger than all the trade and goods and services in the world put together. Uh, 25 times all U.S. GNP, five, uh, global GNP, excuse me, uh, $5.1 trillion a day. It's the biggest industry in the world, and it dwarfs in its impact any trade agreements that are made. Uh, any trade agreements can be nullified by central banks manipulating their currencies. So we need, and this, this is another problem that's being addressed by the cryptocosm, by the new movement of uh, digital currencies increasingly linked to gold and uh, promising to restore money as a measuring stick rather than a magic, bond, a magic wand for big banks. All right, this is my final question to you, and it's, I say it with pain because I'd like to ask you so much more. But I, I am curious, another question I don't know how you'll answer. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the American future? I'm, I'm optimistic about the American future. By temperament, I'm optimistic. I, I think that uh, it's been a, the Trump election was really an amazing surprise. And his um, emergence as a real conservative has been quite stunning. And uh, I, think, uh, I think that uh, there are many reasons to be optimistic. And among them is this fantastic creativity of the cryptocosm, this, this new, uh, imagine, we've had no IPOs for 20 years, just almost no tech IPOs of consequence, a 90% drop, a 50% drop in companies on the stock exchange, in public companies have dropped 50%. And here, um, Valerick Buterin gets lured out of college by Peter Thiel's fellowship and goes to Israel and learns about new cryptographic possibilities in Israel, master coins and colored coins, comes back and starts Ethereum. And within a year, $17 trillion of new money has been channeled to some 2,000 startups. It's just an amazing efflorescence. Well, all right. George Gilder's book, Life After Google. George, you're, you're a treasure. Thank you so much. We'll be back in a moment. We will be back. Hello, everybody. Dennis Prager here. Stockton, California. Jeff. Hello, Jeff. Dennis Prager. Yeah, I take, you were talking about global warming earlier, and I, I take it you don't feel it's relevant if a scientist receives large money, uh, amounts of money from the coal and energy industries. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I missed the first half of that sentence. I heard coal industries. I'm sorry. I, you don't think it's important if a climate uh, denier receives large amounts of money from the coal industries? I can't tell you how painful it is to me that you believe this gigantic lie about scientists 
who have the courage to dissent like Richard Lindzen of MIT. The, see, let me explain, and then you'll have all the time you want to respond. You cannot believe that anyone who differs with you is sincere. I can. I believe that the people who believe that we are going to destroy the planet really believe that. But you cannot believe that a single scientist who says that maybe we're not heeding to catastrophe, maybe it's not caused by carbon emissions, can possibly be a sincere scientist. He must be a whore. That you believe that says only things about you. Now you can respond. Yeah, my response is Richard Linton received large amounts of money from the coal industry. He doesn't deny it. And I think you're the naive person, Dennis. I'm the what person? Naive. Naive. Okay, so again, I, I, you, you, you agree with me that you cannot imagine a, any scientist sincerely believing on scientific bases that we can question the, uh, the threat that global warming uh, 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 is or constitutes to the world or that it is overwhelmingly produced by carbon emissions. The person must be selling their soul for money. It's an astonishing thing to me. I, 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 I don't know. I, look, I'm just going to end up repeating myself. So we're, we're clear, I, and I will just end it with that. We both uh, we agree where we differ. You you can't believe this is. By the way, this is one of the uh, really uh, one of the reasons I have contempt for the left. That is their view of everyone they differ with. If you don't agree on uh, on uh, race based affirmative action, you're a racist. Uh, if you uh, don't believe there is a rape crisis at colleges, you're a misogynist. See, there, it is not possible in the left-wing view that you can sincerely differ with them. You're a whore or a scumbag by definition. That is the left-wing mind. That's why I have contempt for it. It's contemptible. Uh, let's hear uh, another contemptible uh, statement. This is by Professor Douglas Brinkley, Rice University. And I, I had him many years ago on the show, and I won't be reading his uh, books of history. He, they, these people don't understand that uh, their over-the-top statements, these professors, mean that uh, at least half the society won't read any of their books not because we differ with them, but because they are so uh, demagogic. Here's uh, Brinkley. Article 3, right, in Section 3 of the Constitution says this. Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them CNN. aid and comfort. So no president has ever been charged with treason, Douglas. Do, do you believe the president's actions fall anywhere within that definition? Well, we had a vice president, Aaron Burr, in 1807, who was charged with treason. There was a famous trial, and they didn't feel that they had the, um, the goods to bust Burr fully. Uh, the problem with the enemy aiding and betting Don is that Russia is not officially right now considered an enemy of the United States, but we all also know they had a cyber attack on us. So Donald Trump's got the uh, kind of the slippery slope of legal language in his favor. But the spirit of what Trump did. What is, is that? By the way, what does treason. that mean? A slippery slope of, of legal language? I don't even. I don't even understand the comment. But go on. Yeah. Okay. He's got the uh, kind of the slippery slope of legal language in his favor. But the spirit of what Trump did is clearly treasonous. It's a betrayal of um, the United States. He threw our U.S. intelligence services, uh, flushed them. Away and, and, you know, um, by the way, uh, uh, I'm not the first to make this point about the, the all of a sudden the the left are the great defenders of our intelligence services. Read what any of the left said about our intelligence services after the uh, Trump uh, Bush lied, people died lie that they perpetrated and how uh, uh, utterly irresponsible uh, the intelligence services were. They, they were OK about throwing them under the bus then. And the only people who've thrown the uh, intelligence services under the bus are the intelligence services heads like uh, Brennan and Clapper. Uh, Brennan is an ex-communist who sounds like a present-day communist, okay? Uh, he, 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 
you can't get lower than that guy. And uh, they, they unfortunately, have done damage to the intelligence community. Not Trump. Go on, please. Through our U.S. intelligence services, uh, flushed them away, and and um, it came off as being a, a puppet of Putin. So the word okay. That, that this is a historian. It. Hold on, this is a an eminent or an eminent in, in the in the eyes of the of his fellow historians, which is, I guess, for some all that matters. Uh, at, at Rice University, an eminent university. Uh, who is saying this? And, and and this is this this is so un unhistorical and unfactual. It's <laughs> this is what your kids this is what your kids are getting when they go to Rice or Columbia, where I went, or you 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 name it. This is what they're getting because they don't consider this opinion; they consider this teaching. 1 8 Prager 776 877 243 7776. Back in a moment. The Dennis Prager Show, live from the Relief Factor Pain Free Studio. Something evolving Wherever may come The world keeps revolving They say the next big thing is here That the revolution's near But to me it seems quite clear That it's all just All right, everybody. Courtney in Chicago. Dennis Prager, hi. Dennis, I'm such a huge fan. Wait a minute, you're going to yell at me because I have earbuds on. Hold on. <laughs> I never <laughs> yell. I... Yeah. Okay, she took the earbuds off and disconnected. What I have here from the screener is, loves what Dennis says about tolerating different views within the conservative movement. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I have my eye on the ball. The greatest good you could do in the United States today is defeat the left. That is the greatest good, okay? Not liberals, the left. Leftism ruins everything it touches, from the Boy Scouts to the universities to music and art and architecture to religion. Leftism is sick, and it is morally sick. It is intellectually sick. There are now universities that are where professors are arguing that the idea of objective reality is a white male invention, all right. You, you, the problem is most people, most liberals certainly don't know how bad the left is. They don't want to know because they have been indoctrinated from birth to believe that their enemy is the right, that conservatives are a threat, not the left. Anyway, that's the reason that I want to welcome. Is she there? But I'm just going to give it another try. Are you still there? No, she's not. Okay. Anyway, uh, that's why I want to have everybody in the conservative movement. Cliff in Detroit, Dennis Prager, thank you for calling. Oh, hi, Dennis. I love your show. Good. Thank you. Um, just one thing occurred to me. Uh, the caller a couple uh, calls ago when he mentioned about the scientists getting money from the oil, uh, uh, from oil companies or whatever, and it dawned on me that most of the so-called scientists are, you know, they they get grant money. That doesn't uh, count to they, these people. See, that's not yeah, tainted. Right. That, that, uh, yeah. The, right, and and uh, by the way, and the ratio of government money to private money to scientists on, on global warming issues, I, I don't know exactly what it is. I wouldn't be surprised if it's $100 to every dollar. It may be $1,000 to every dollar. There are staggering millions upon millions of dollars. And believe me, if you are a scientist and you have no, uh, no conscience, all you want to do is make money, you will go to the side that believes global warming is, is an existential threat. That's where the money is. Okay, everybody, thanks for listening. I'll see you tomorrow. I'm Dennis Prager.
The civilization born of Judeo-Christian values, ancient Greek philosophy, and the discoveries of the Enlightenment is staring at the abyss brought there by its own hand. To put it starkly, Europe is committing suicide. How did this happen? It's a complicated story, but there are two major causes. The first is the mass movement of peoples into Europe. This has been going on steadily since the end of World War II, but sped up massively in the migration crisis of 2015 when more than a million migrants poured into Europe from the Middle East, North Africa and East Asia. The second, and equally significant, is that Europe lost faith in itself, its beliefs, its traditions, and even its very legitimacy. Let's take a closer look at both causes. For decades, Europe encouraged people, mostly from the Middle East and North Africa, to come as temporary workers. Nobody expected them to stay, yet they did. And nobody asked them to leave, even those who came illegally. As one British immigration minister put it in 1999, removal takes too long and it's emotional. And, of course, why would they leave? The economic opportunities were far greater in Europe than from where they came, and if the work dried up, there were generous welfare benefits to be had. For a time, immigrants were allowed, even encouraged, thanks to the European commitment to multiculturalism, to pursue whatever culture they wanted. But that didn't work out well. The leaders of Britain, France and Germany admitted as much in 2011 when David Cameron, Nicolas Sarkozy and Angela Merkel dramatically announced that multiculturalism had failed. So, the immigrants were then asked to assimilate and embrace Western values. If that happened, European governments reasoned, all the financial costs, even the occasional acts of terrorism, could be overlooked. But it never happened, and immigration just increased. During 2015, Germany and Sweden added 2% to their populations in a single year. By 2017, the most popular boy's name in the United Kingdom was Mohammed. So, why did European leaders decide Europe could take in anyone in the world, whether fleeing war or simply seeking a better life, no matter how different or even opposed their values were to European values? The one word answer to this question is guilt. Aren't these refugees, the thinking goes, fleeing the consequences of European imperialism? Didn't we mercilessly exploit these unfortunate people in their home countries? Aren't we the cause of their misery? Accepting them into Europe is meant to be a wiping away of this guilt. This is especially true of Germany. In allowing one and a half million people into her country in 2015, Angela Merkel was, in effect, proclaiming to the world that Germany, the great aggressor of the 20th century, the architect of the Holocaust, would be the humanitarian superpower of the 21st. A noble sentiment, perhaps, but who pays the price? the ordinary citizens of Europe, who've seen crime and terrorism increase exponentially. Their fears and frustrations have been largely ignored, or worse. In October 2015, the German government designated that 800 newly arrived immigrants were to be housed in the German town of Kassel. Concerned residents had a meeting to ask questions of their representatives. As a video recording shows, that his citizens were calm and polite, and then, at a certain point, their district president informs them that the refugees are coming regardless of their objections, and anyone who does not agree with the policy is free to leave Germany. This official attitude, if there is a problem, it's not with the refugees but with the citizens, reflects a sense of what I call tiredness. A feeling among the elite class that the European story has played out, that we've tried religion and all imaginable forms of politics, and that each has one after another led us to disaster. We taint every idea we touch, so who's to say that the world wouldn't be better off without us? Of course, only people who have no idea how lucky they are could take this view. Ironically, no one knows this better than those refugees who truly did assimilate and who defend Western values. Extraordinary people like Somali-born Ayaan Hersiali, who left the Netherlands because she believed in the principles of the Enlightenment more than the Dutch did. Or Hamid Abdel Samid in Germany, whose life is threatened by fellow immigrants because he defends European values. 
This is the stuff of suicide, the self-annihilation of a culture. It is possible that ordinary Europeans will join their leaders in this pact, but recent opinion polls suggest that they have no intention of doing so. How they act on that intention will be the great story of the years ahead. Are we about to witness the end of Europe or its rebirth? I'm Douglas Murray, author of The Strange Death of Europe for Prager University. Thank you for watching this video. To help keep PragerU videos free, please consider making a tax-deductible donation. You're listening to The Dennis Prager Show. My guest now is in Britain, if I am not mistaken. He is a Brit, Douglas Murray, I've had on a number of times because of his extremely significant work, The Strange Death of Europe. He teaches the, the newest Prager University video, The Suicide of Europe. It's got over a million views in two days. Douglas Murray, welcome back to my show. It's very good to be with you again, Dennis. Are you in Britain right now? I am. I'm in the heart of Westminster. Well, you know, it is amazing because you're clearer than calls that I get from California. This, it's biz- <laughs> no, it's totally bizarre to me how often this works out that way. In, in any event, it's great to hear your voice. Uh, you have a magnificent video out there. Are you happy with it? Very happy, yes. Uh, it was a great pleasure to uh, record it earlier in the year and to, um, to see the finished product. And uh, it's had a terrific response already. And I think, uh, you know, we really pack an enormous amount into a five-minute video. It's, uh, it's extraordinary. Yeah, well, that's the intent. I read to my listeners today a piece Uh, From the Daily Mail, in fact, and it is about Sweden. And uh, the the gist of it is, uh, Sweden does simply does not have enough young workers uh, to man the government, let alone private enterprise. And they're going to have to bring in, and this is a small country, at least a quarter of a million more people by by uh, twenty twenty five, and within seven years. This uh, th- th- does this surprise you? No, this is uh, th- the stories of this kind go uh, up and down uh, at the moment. Sometimes we get told that, uh, for instance, that, that we need to have migration at the levels that a lot of European leaders seem to want it to be, because we need to fill jobs in the labour market. Uh, sometimes they they go the other way and say, actually, uh, you know, we need. Uh, more educated type of labor. And they, they, they just come out with these, I think, increasingly contradictory justifications for things they would have done anyway. And, um, and one of them is this extraordinary idea that, that first of all, that all, all um, populations need to sort of keep on growing in size. And that, uh, that, you know, that it's sort of without any possible ramifications if you decide that the next generation might come from Eritrea, for instance. Um, and, and, and they go on and on trying to avoid the main thing, which is, are they absolutely sure that importing often actually incredibly unskilled labor uh, to a modern economy like Sweden is such a good thing? I think there are a whole range of things you would do if you actually decided you had roles in your economy you needed to fill. Um, and, and the worst thing of all is to go with the kind of random third world ra- migration that they've done in recent years. It makes no sense. So I, I was thinking when I read this that in addition to all the reasons you give in, in your book, The Strange Death of Europe, and in the video for PragerU, I, it, it occurred to me reading this article that the welfare state is another gravitational force pulling right. in people into Europe. Well, that's right. I mean, there are several things. You, you often hear people saying, for instance, that we need people to come from outside to help run the welfare state. This seems to me, I haven't read this story you refer to yet, but this seems to me to be a variation on that theme. Right. Uh, you know, we need more government employees. 
Yes. Um, w- w- one reason you might need them is because you've got more people, because you just imported 3% of your population in one year alone in 2015. Um, so so you know, this is the sort of thing, we, we often get the argument in Britain that, that uh, we need to import more doctors and nurses. Yes, hold it there. I want, I want, don't lose that thought. I'm, I'm speaking with Douglas Murray. This is the latest video at PragerU and his great book, The Strange Death of Europe. And he is, in fact, my guest right now, Douglas Murray is, and he's in Britain. And I raised the issue of an, yet another reason for Europe's importing of immigrants from the Middle East, especially, but from anywhere, and that is the uh, the insatiable appetite of socialist governments for people. Yeah. That's right. And we were just mentioning before the break that, you know, there's this argument that's given that you need lots of people from the third world to come to Europe in order to be doctors and nurses. And putting aside the fact that by no means all the people arriving are indeed doctors and nurses, they not only provide sometimes doctors and nurses, they also, of course, provide all the people who need those doctors and nurses. And so we get stuck in this cycle of justifications for things. And, uh, and you know, at no point in this, whenever any, when, uh, one of the key things about all of this is you never hear a government like the government of Sweden saying, for instance, we've got spaces in our workforce we need filling, and we'll go to Italy, which is a fellow European Union member, where there are 35% youth unemployment, and we'll see if we can get some of the young Italians to come up and work. They never say that. Why not? They always just Why? open the borders right. and Why? say anyone who gets here first. That's a very powerful point. Why? You know, because they, it's not about the thing they're pretending it's about. The fact is that they lose control of the borders all the time. It's happened for decades. It's sped up in recent years. They've lost control of the borders. They don't want to say that legal and illegal immigration has a difference. They don't want to do anything about people who just walk in illegally. And so in the end, it's just a big mess, which they have to find reasons to justify. (laughs) So uh, it's so unbelievable that Sweden would not prefer an Italian, and it has nothing to do with race for those uh, listening who went to college and and had their minds distorted. This has nothing to do with race. It has everything to do with values and only values. The chances of an Italian sharing a Swede's values are greater than a Syrian sharing a Swede's values. Is that fair? Before I go on, is that a fair statement? Yes, absolutely. At the very least, it's like if, if the European Union is as it wants to be, something like America, uh, a, a conglomeration of states, then, then this, this makes as much sense as you having massive unemployment in Boston and deciding in New York when there are jobs that need filling that you'll go and get the workforce from Venezuela. It, 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 it makes no sense if you believe that you have a, a cohesive society you want to keep together. You get the people who are, who, who are already within uh, the jurisdiction of that area, and you go to people with the most likely to have similar education, background, and, uh, and, and culture. And, and they, just, they just ignore this all the time. And they do because of, of doctrine, not pragmatism. And, and I have to say, it's also just enormous fear on their part of something they fear more than anything else, which is that if they ever, for instance, got a grip on the borders, if they ever actually decided that the law mattered and that illegal immigration was different from legal immigration, then somebody might do that terrible thing and turn around and say that they are bigots. I see. And okay, that's very this, important. The Swedish authorities fear uh-huh. that more than anything else. Okay, that's right. You know, I, I wrote... Uh, more my, than death. I wrote... <laughs> More than death. I wrote my column last week on the subject, the most powerful force in America today is fear of the left. And that is yeah. exactly what you, how you are describing Europe. Yeah, this is it. They would, they would, they would rather die than be accused of racism things that are actually inaccurate by people who are right. insincere. Right. It's unbelievable. All right, good. This is all clarifying for my listeners and, of course, for me. Next... Your book is now translated into German, and uh, Angela Merkel is the leader of the pack with regard to bringing in people from the Middle East. Uh, first of all, uh, are, 
there's even a part of me that's surprised that a German publisher would want to publish your book. <laughs> yes. I mean, the book was the number one bestseller in the UK. Uh, it's uh, sold enormously well in America and elsewhere. But the German translation rights were sold last. Uh, they okay. have now caught up, and uh, uh, it came out a few weeks ago in Germany, and it's been very interesting. Uh, the, the Angela Merkel certainly gets the blame more than anyone else from me, and uh, Germany, I think, is at the crux of this problem. Uh, uh, the book sold out on the first weekend in Germany uh, and was swiftly reprinted, but the German media have done a total boycott. Uh -huh. uh, um, exactly. There's been one, one hit piece, but apart from that, total silence. And That's I'm right. told by all my German friends that is absolutely to be expected because they fear yes. this debate more than anything. That's right. That's right. David Horowitz has said to me on, on many occasions on the air and off the air that before he left the left, every book he wrote was reviewed in the New York Times. When he left the left... Not one has ever been reviewed. Yes. And there's something fascinating about this because, of course, if I, or David Horowitz in that case, if I was onto absolutely nothing and I just made stuff up about Germany and libeled various German politicians, then, then I'm fairly sure that they would, they would notice it and laugh about it or so on and so forth. But there, there are the, you know, it's one of these things, you know you're over the target when it gets this sort of, uh, um, this sort of uh, blackout around it. The public really want to know about this because it's about our future. Mm -hmm. uh, but the media don't want the public uh, to find out about this. Uh, and the political class in Germany in particular really don't want the public to find out about this. On a quick other matter, if you can answer it quickly even, why, why is Europe so anti-Israel? Oh, well, we, we, look, if you don't want to defend your own borders and we don't defend our own borders anymore, why would you have any sympathy with Israelis when they actually do? That's great. That is great. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. I asked him to give me a quick answer. Uh, that my uh, I I'm simply speechless. It was so terrific. We'll be back in a moment with Douglas Murray. This is the latest video at Prayer U. I'm Dennis Prager. Final segment here. Unfortunately, I could talk to Douglas Murray for three hours. Back probably three hours and ten minutes. He is the author of this very important book that I've cited so often, The Strange Death of Europe. As a result, he's made a Prager University video. It's out this week, The Suicide of Europe. Your answer, your terrific answer, why Europe is anti-Israel. Israel, if, if we don't believe in borders, what are we going to support? Israel's belief in borders? Is that is that a good summary of what you said? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so I'm, it. it made me think of uh, the antipathy to, to Donald Trump may also right. be, at least in, in large part, not totally, a border issue. This president believes in borders. Yes, you see, for, for, for most modern Europeans, or at least modern European leaders, uh, borders are just so 20th century. And, uh, <laughs> they ca and they believe that borders lead to wars. And that if you just took away the borders, we wouldn't have all those nasty wars we've had. I mean, there's been, there, are, there are misunderstandings like this about our history that are so enormous, you wonder whether they could ever be corrected. Uh, instead of seeing the nation state as the guarantor of peace, they see it as the only cause of war. And so when they see Israel protecting its borders or Donald Trump talking about the importance of defending the border, the southern border in the U.S., they think, how 20th century of them, uh, uh, we've gone beyond that. And, you know, at the very least, I say to them, uh, you may think you've gone beyond that, but there is a whole world of trouble that's storing up in Europe because we no longer believe in that basic thing that a border should exist. Right, and therefore, the obvious, that a nation should exist. And going yeah. back to Israel, Israel is a double whammy, now that I think of it. They affirm a national identity and a religious identity. And if national identity is 20th century, religious identity is 16th century. 
Absolutely. And, and you see, again, I mean, modern European governments broadly think that we, certainly Western European governments, think we've gone so far beyond that. We've not only gone beyond the nation state, we've gone beyond religion. Exactly. We don't have any of these old no, hang ups. That's right. And they look at Israel and they feel totally unsympathetic to it right. and then hostile to it. OK, when are you coming back to the U.S.? Um, as soon as I get my asylum permits uh, all signed up. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of leaving California seeking asylum. So <laughs> we'll meet in the middle. I look forward to it. Uh, Douglas Murray, you're a joy. His book is great. His video is great. Read one and see the other. I'm Dennis Prager. Thank you for listening.